Welcome to Sales Velocity TV, where we pull back the curtain on how the top businesses in the world sell more with less resistance. Bringing over 50 plus years of combined sales experience and over 100 million in revenue generated, please welcome the hosts of Sales Velocity TV and two incredibly entertaining gentlemen, Andrew Cass and Aaron Parkinson. Aaron, how are you, my man? Looking good today. Uh, got a, a love-hate topic on our hands here today, I think, is the best way to put it as we come out of the gates here. Is that you're laughing because I think you're agreeing with me. It's uh, it's a topic we visited in 2023, and it's it's retention, really, customer development and retention. And, you know, it's not that difficult to acquire a customer today, but it's pretty difficult to keep them today because of all the distractions and the noise and the overwhelm and the amount of choices that they have out there. So... Uh, we're going to unpack what we're seeing because we have big businesses that require retention to to thrive and scale. And we're going to talk about maybe some strategies on how to do a better job with customer development and retention because this is the name of the game. It isn't about acquiring a customer. That's half the battle. It's about developing the customer over time to become a more valuable customer in your business. The best businesses in the world, you look at Apple as a huge example. You look at Amazon, you look at this. These are the big daddies, right? You look at Tesla. You look at Tesla's a great example, right? Looking at the, the really big daddy companies. But then let's tear it down to like a medium sized company here, or maybe, maybe a company that, that you do business with that um, you just have, have cult like followings because they create such great experiences and they're always bringing in new products and services. And it's fun and it's interesting and there's new things being. Uh, released into their into their ecosystem. That's an important piece of the puzzle too. Is keeping people interested, not just retaining them because you want to retain them because you want them to keep paying you in a continuity model, but keeping them interested in, in what's going on. And I'll talk a little bit about what we do in our company. You can talk a little bit about what you do in your agency, and then we'll talk about some of the things we're seeing from companies that are doing a really good job at keeping people interested and retaining them for a long period of time. Well, I think this is a super important topic for right now because. You and I see a lot of data with a lot of different businesses. And right now, going into you know the sort of middle of 2024, we're in the first quarter, right? The, the economy, I think everybody would agree, was pretty rough last year. I, we saw a lot of volatility. And, and when you go into a, a new quarter, everybody's spirits kind of naturally rise. It's a new year, you know, new goals, new initiatives, et cetera, et cetera. But when we look at the state of the marketplace right now, uh, credit balances on mm. cards, all-time high, um, defaulted car loans, all-time high, mm. um, mortgages right on the brink. You know, you get all those people that are about to be refinanced. You know, they've been holding on to those 2 3% mortgages that are about to expire. You know, going into an election year, there's a lot of elements that are right on the edge of creating maybe an even more difficult time than 2023. And you know me, Andrew, I'm the eternal optimist. Like, I think... If anybody's watched or listened to our show a long time, sometimes I'm the optimist and you're the pessimist, right? And that's why we make a good balance. But you, you can't you can't ignore the reality. Well, that's called where, pragmatism. I like to say I'm more of a pragmatist than a pessimist. And I think you are as well. You just lean towards optimism. And I do too for the most part, but I, I, I try to stay in the middle as best I can and not deny reality, but look at reality and figure out how can I improve reality, not really change reality, but improve reality, improve the reality, right? Yeah. So I think you, you and I do a pretty decent job of, pragmatism when we look at things i think we're you know we can recognize when something is not right and not pretend it isn't right and we can actually then make better decisions for our companies and for our clients i think you would agree with that yeah i do agree with that and I, it's funny i actually had a conversation with my son the other day um you know he was getting you know bullied a little bit at oldest school. or middle son or youngest, middle, I mean. my youngest you know Your my youngest. youngest he was getting you know he gets a lot of like mean things said to him really? from a few oh, God, I hate hearing school. stuff like yeah. that, man. It, 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 you know, it, I hate it hearing me more than, I, than kids being bullies to other kids. I, I, I it just bothers me a lot. But breaks ahead, my heart, me. right? But I said to him, look, you know, what I've learned a long time ago is that if you take extreme responsibility for anything, it takes away the power from other people. So in this particular case, um, some kids were calling him fat, right? He's not fat at all. He's he's actually leaned down quite a bit. But I said to him. You have kind of two choices in this scenario right now. You can let those people hurt you with their words and stay status quo. Or on the other side, how could they call you fat if you just got unbelievably jacked? 
Exactly. In other words, can you use it to motivate you? Can you use it to motivate you and you can you take away the the weapons? And I said, you have kind of two choices in this scenario. And he said, well, no, they couldn't call me that. I said, well, they could, but they'd be kind of stupid if they did. And so I said, you, you can use it and you can take responsibility and you can change or you can just perpetually stay wounded. And he said, no, I'm going to I'm going to start lifting three days a week in addition to everything else I'm doing. I said, great. That's a that's a great way to take personal responsibility and and change the narrative. And when we're looking at tough times in anything and specifically we're talking about the economy, right, you can choose to be a victim or you can choose to see it and then plan and strategize and be proactive and take extreme responsibility, which is often the topics that we cover on this show is how do you take extreme responsibility and plan and strategize to improve? And so when we're looking at the current status quo, we've got two things working against us right now. We've got the economic factors. We've got a new, we got an election coming up, which is always a circus, right? And then this one got, might be the Barnum and Bailey. What's the biggest circus ever? To, <laughs> I think it was Barnum and Bailey. Yeah, this is going to be Barnum and Bailey's circus. It's, it's WWE level circus. Oh, coming this up. one's yeah. this is Super Bowl style circus. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got these elements playing against us. So if we want to take extreme responsibility, we have to look at our businesses and we, we have to understand that there's a ton of distraction coming at the clientele. There's a ton of options coming at the clientele. And maybe now more than any time in the last five years, people are really analyzing every transaction and weighing sure out are. its value. They are. You know, I know that I I did it in December with not only my uh, my personal expenses, mm -hmm. but also my business expenses. You did like a full and audit top down. I did everything. a full audit. It's a great and, move. And uh, if you if you haven't done this, and this might be a great place to start the show, even though we're not talking about retention, is I I really believe that once a quarter. You should you should audit your home finances and you should audit your business finances and and almost have like a P and L for each one. People kind of kind of think I'm weird. I have a P and L for my house, you know, for our. Well, our listen, net. your home's a business. I mean, it, it's an entity. A it's not a. Right? Business. I don't think that's out there at all. I think it's intelligent. I didn't and, know and you did I, that. When you say yeah, P and L for your home, do you mean like just like the, the expenses of the home? Or we have our expenses, we have our goals, we have our investments, we have our equity and our properties. But referring to the, to your, your primary residence, though, is what I'm referring to. So you're saying correct. you do a P&L for your primary residence. No, I no. do a P&L for the, basically for our net worth of me and my wife and our, our assets, our liabilities, our... So overall big picture, not just the Overall house big itself. picture. I thought you said the house itself. Yeah, and, and what we do, my wife and I, is we review it once a month together. And we go through, you know, what are our hard costs? What are we spending money on? What do we want versus what do we need? You know, what do we want to increase? What do we want to decrease? What are our investing goals for this month? You know, what are our fund goals? What are our object objectives? And that way we're on the same page. And it was interesting because in December, you know, we had a little bit of a slower month in, in my business. And so it kind of made me take a step back and go, mm, I really need to analyze this. And we, we put these things into play. And I, Andrew, in subscriptions alone in our home, we eliminated something like twenty thousand dollars a year. Really? In subscriptions, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't believe when we went down the rabbit hole, and a lot of it had to do with my kids. Wow. And if you have kids, they're on, you know, all these different games, and they're on these different creative apps, and this and that. And we found a ton of stuff that we weren't paying attention to, and we just wiped it out. We removed credit cards from their accounts. We we just did all these things to eliminate. They must have been those. psyched. Yeah, well, I was stoked. They were not. Um, <laughs> I was and, being sarcastic. They weren't too yeah, happy exactly. when they were going we to log into things, and it was like, no, you no longer have an account. You no longer have a credit card attached to it. So the, the we, we did that, and we looked at some of the expenses that were frivolous and unnecessary, and we kind of wiped them out. And then I went into the business. Andrew, this is going to blow your mind and probably terrify you. I, look, I did a complete top-down audit of people, subscriptions, services, uh, so many things. And I'll give you one one hard example. Um, you're familiar with Zapier. Yes, right? of course. So Zaps, you yeah. know, integrating yeah. different technology yeah. Multiple platforms. Multiple techs speaking to each other. You got to have yeah. it, right? Absolutely. I went in and I looked at our Zap bill and our Zap bill was $900 a month. And I went to my tech team and I said, why? Can you please analyze this and tell me why, why we have this? Do we need it? Explain why we need it. And they went and audited it and they said, oh, it was a different a different level of the service that we thought we needed six months ago. So we put it in place and then we didn't actually need it. And we just haven't looked at it again. That was 
$600 a month reduction. Because you probably needed worked. about 300 obviously, right? A couple hundred. We needed about $335. Yep. But 600 a month times six months. And if you've got a if you've got a profit margin of 20% in your business, that means that I needed to do $3,000 a month in sales to cover that one subscription. Sure. That was one thing I found. When I actually went complete up and down audit every financial transaction of the last three months and people that I was kind of kind of using but not really using but you know blah 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 i cleared up twenty thousand dollars a month i love it man in expenses in my business you're and you're motiv you're motivating me to do it because i've been meaning to do it in all of 2024 and i haven't done it I, it's one of those things where i know i need to go through with a fine tooth comb find all of that stuff and start eliminating figuring out is this necessary right it, it's it's easy to not look at it when you're making a ton of money and you're having great yeah, months. I, I was but just isn't going, it amazing how like when you have one off month, you're like, we need to look at every single goddamn expense mm -hmm. now. <laughs> it's like, well, where were right. you for a year? And, and actually, we're all guilty of it. And the funny thing is, is that with my CFO, he now comes and meets me the day after I meet, I do my financial planning with my wife now every single month, and we go through it top to bottom every single month now because I'm not getting in the place that does I was. Do, do, does he? Do you go through the P and L? Is that what you do? I go through the PL, I go through bank the budget, both. and I go through the bank accounts every transaction. Got it. Right? Yep. Is right. this can we can we can we attribute this to something? Is it necessary? No, boom, done. Okay, great. That twenty thousand that was going out, that's pure profit. Yeah, man. I'm so glad that's you I'm so glad profit. you you went on this tangent here, this good tangent, because uh, me for sure I'm gonna do it because I've been meaning to, but I think anybody listening, what a great idea to audit anyways. Right. We talk about auditing your sales process a lot, but auditing your finances, they're neck and neck. I mean, this is there's no business without without sound sales and sound finance. So I think it's a great point that you made. I want to come back to the point about your son and then we'll loop back to why you went down the, the rabbit hole of auditing. And then we'll talk about how the auditing actually applies to customer development and customer. And experience. before you go into that, yeah. here's what my CFO said. He looked at it and he said, just remember, you have a 30 percent profit margin in your company. Yep, it's healthy. $20,000 a month we just cleared up. Jumps he, said, you need, he said you needed to do $75,000 in new revenue just to cover what we just Got eliminated. It. So it's not just about what we eliminated, it's about understanding how much more in gross sales you would have had to do to cover that. Yep. So he said every time you think about spending from now on, I want you to look at the number and I want you to triple it because that's what you have to do in sales to cover that expense. So even in the last month, my team's been saying stuff like, oh, we need to upgrade this software. We need to do this. It's an extra 150 bucks a month, 200 bucks a month, blah, 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 blah. And I'm going, you absolutely go, You not. say why. Prove why, right? Now you're prove, prove, why. prove why that new expense why. is necessary right now. Absolutely. Because they only see 200 bucks. And now I'm seeing 600, 800 a month more I have to do in sales. Yeah. To cover that, it's given me a complete shift in how I'm looking at things, which I mean, I should have already, but it, it's common sense, but sometimes but it's easy to get away from to your point, right? It is very easy. So it's easy to get away from, which, which to your point, I mean, uh, again, the sales process and the retention process, which is the theme of the show today. What are you drinking, by the way? I am drinking a, a bubbly blackberry water. How many times do I need to tell you when you go on the podcast and you're talking that you don't want to drink carbonated drinks because it sort of creates a little indigestion and maybe I don't really it doesn't really affect you. You're the master communicator in my view. So if you can drink bubbly carbonated drinks and still communicate well, I'd be like, what? like I wouldn't be finishing what? sentences okay. with it. <laughs> let out the biggest belch on this show just to just completely spin you sideways. Yeah, because you do a pretty good job of not being able to like to me, it disrupts like your sentences, right? You, you get a little, it's, 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 you're it's, off on a tangent. Go back. To what anyway, saying, so uh, listen, great advice son. on your son. My son is a little older than your son. Your son, mm -hmm. I think is 11 or 12. My son just turned 13, right? I yeah, think my son's 12. Okay. Yeah. So one, one, I know we're one year off. So, um, great advice there because they're at a, t they're at a, a tough time in their lives now. Uh, puberty, body's yep. changing, voice is changing. Um, liking girls. Girls, I mean, girls are starting to come into the equation. Oh, it's yeah. I'm seeing it all right now. And I'm like, Interestingly, I've been meaning to have an off podcast conversation with you since you've already brought two kids through the teenage years, including yeah. one boy. And everybody in my life has girls. I only have a couple mm -hmm. friends that have boys that have been teenagers and now because I know I know your oldest son is now 17, 17. Yeah. So you're anyway. So my son's now like sports, girls, appearance, like 
body, you know, I mean, he's, he's in really good shape, by the way, because he's he wants to be like he's he really takes good care of himself. But that was really good advice that you gave your son. I think that's that's uh, important to use the adversity as a motivator. We talk a lot about that on the show. Uh, pivoting now to customer development. Uh, Before you go into that, because it's our show, I can go on any tangent we want. That's true. Good point. So, well, something I'm going to to tell the men who listen to this show, if they've got kids at this age or coming into this age that I figured out in my journey that I think could be really, really I helpful. I think we should do a whole show on it, whatever it is. But go okay. ahead and say what it so, is. I, I, when I started to see those changes happen at about 13 with my other son, right. um, I remembered back to when I went through them and how confused I was and you know, you got the hormones kicking in and friend groups get weird and you know all these different elements come together at the same time. I actually, the only other, the, the only time that I had thoughts of suicide. Suicide. Yeah, where when I was 15 years old, oh, that, it was a really crazy. difficult time for me. And and when I think back on the reasons why, they weren't big reasons, but just there's a lot of hormones, there's a lot of challenges that happen in those teenage years, et cetera, et cetera. And the thought a couple times, you know, went into my brain, and then I overcame it and worked out. But it's really common in those ages. Mm. Is so when I thought back on that time frame in my life, I said I want to make sure that my son has a, an outlet to talk through what they perceive to be very challenging issues in their life. So what I did is I actually started taking them out for dinner with me once a week to the same spot, same restaurant, just talking and just, about stuff. just talking about all these right? issues. And he wouldn't bring the issues up the majority of the time. He would occasionally bring them up, but I would ask him about these things that I knew he was going through. And then he would open up very yes. quickly. Me too with and my son, same. He one on one time right there. He reflects back on it and he's like, you know, dinner night with dad is my favorite thing on the entire planet. And I and I was able to see the chinks in the armor that were happening and educate him and steer him in the right direction by just giving him that one predictable one hour every week was just him and I, no mom, no brothers, no sisters, exactly. where we could just talk. And I just saw this like rapid evolution. I love it. Man. I Between love what 13. you just said. I do the same thing with my son. I, I still, my son's my first kid. So I, I, he gets a little annoyed that I baby him a little bit still. I, we, I call it best buddy night still. Okay. Yeah, kind, kind of corny. Right. But I used Whatever. to do that when he was three. Hey, we're going to have a best buddy night or a best buddy day. Like it might, might be a night out, like you said, or it's, you know, sometimes it's two hours in the car because you know, I'm in Naples and he's in Miami during the week with his right. for, for school and we're trying to get that fixed. But so, but I had to have the talk, Aaron, last month. Ooh. The talk. Two yeah, I've hours it lasted in the car. And I thought it was going to be like 10 minutes, awkward, change the subject. And he opened up to me. He mm. kept asking me more questions as I was planting information about what you might be feeling and seeing. These are common things. Here's what this means. And I'm like, this thing's going to probably be, I'm, it's awkward enough for me. Can you imagine what it must be like for him? I'm thinking this is going to be 10 or 15 minutes. It's, 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 it ended up almost 90. Yeah, Which I absolutely. thought was really good that that he was engaged and interested and asking questions. What about this? What happens with this? I'm like, oh, my, these are great questions. Fantastic. This is not how I expected this to go. And then it became an actual good, fun, interesting conversation that now I keep coming back to and referencing when something comes up with girls. He's mm -hmm. kind of has a girlfriend right now, which at 13, I think is a little too early, to be honest with you. Bought her a Valentine's Day gift and stuff. I'm like, is this 13? Isn't this like 15? Right. Nah, I was doing so, that at yeah. Anyways, so I was glad to see that you're right. We we in our new show, for those of you who like, when are we going to get to the point uh, when we pivot the show, the new show title, which we've been talking about and hinting at for many months now. Um, one of the reasons we're pivoting off the sales topic is because we would love to be able to do a full show on parenting, as an example. We would love to be able to do a full show on a fitness routine that we're seeing that's working in the fitness space. We would love to do a show on the political stuff that's coming in and what you should be looking at and not looking at and you know some of the propaganda fueling those things. These are the broader topics we want to be talking about, but absolutely love your idea of the parenting and maybe the teenage challenging topic because we both have experience. I'm just starting in the experience, but you've got... You've got plenty of it because you have a grown-up daughter and a son who's nearing the end of the teenage years and one coming into it. So I think these conversations are really important. Most important is the mental health issue, though. Most, Absolutely. most, most, most important because all of it tends to stem back to that mental health issue. And if kids have an outlet and they can talk and be communicated with, that's a great thing. The thing that yep. disturbs me more than anything, which will absolutely be a topic, 
is this transgender thing and the changing of biology as a solution. That is absolutely the most cryptic thing I've ever seen in my life um, because those are mental health issues and they're not being treated as such. They're being treated as some weird cult like uh, solution, which I've never thought I would see in my lifetime, which I think you probably, you know. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of rabbit holes for wow, there. Dude. I think yeah, that that one scares me. That's an American. Well, I say it's an well, and when thing, I look but back, it's really not because it's happening in Canada and the UK also from what I hear. Well, when I, when I look back at my childhood, yep. um, my parents worked very hard, <clears throat> weren't really around very much, and you were left to navigate these questions on your own. Yeah. And the, at least back <clears throat> then, it was more within your own thoughts. What now, if you leave your kids alone to navigate these questions, where do they go? Yeah, man. They go to the they internet. They go to the internet and social media. They go to the propaganda machines and that's not They go into the propaganda machines yeah. that have agendas and they get twisted and pulled in all these different directions. And so they're actually in a worse position than we were. They are in a yeah. way worse position, which will be the topic of that show is what is their outlet? They didn't have an outlet before because there were three TV channels. There yep. was radio. There was no internet and social media. And you know what they would do? You'd talk to your school counselor if you were challenged. Absolutely. That's a good thing. It's a good That's thing. That's a good thing. You'd talk to a human being. Not, so not you, you wouldn't to... talk to this and go, no. wow. You mean Which I could is turn all... into a girl and maybe feel better? I'm a boy now and I could go compete against them in sports? This is some of the insanity that we're seeing right now in this transgender industrial complex. I mean, I, I never thought that a mental health issue would become – a destruction of biology. This is one of the things that needs to be unwound fast so that we can help kids who need the mental health attention that that is. That is a mental health issue. And these kids absolutely need the mental health outlets in, in parenting or leadership or teachers or coaches to help them through that. And, and I think the that's, where, that's where taking a stand for it as the parent that you're going to be the voice of reason as your kids are, are transitioning through those years is so important because if you're not going to be the voice, who is, you're not going to be the sounding who is voice, somebody else will, who is, you don't know who it is. Is it some random influencer? Is That's it right. some website? Is it some social media channel? Is it some YouTube video? And, and what agenda do they have in what they're putting out there versus your only agenda as a parent is to make sure you're healthy, you're happy, you're, you're, you're making progress. You're being a good human. So for me, I felt like I have to carve this out and I'll be honest with you. Anybody you, who thinks you're tremendous, man, anybody who thinks being a parent is easy is very, very wrong. It is a full-time job, especially when you have multiple and there's lots of days. I don't want to deal with your question or your problem. There's lots of days. You don't want to deal with kids at all. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm like, I I, it, you man. know what? I got a million things on my plate. Like, can't you just I figure that it. out? But if you wait too long to really get involved at a high level, you see the result that comes out the other side. You see anger, you see confusion, you see lethargy, you see, uh, you know, lack of focus. All of these, and it's very hard to wind back once it goes down it's that It's hard road. to undo it is what you're saying, right? That's what I'm saying, it's very yeah. hard to undo. You gotta be there day one, Till even beyond the day they leave and be that that exactly. guiding light, that channel, that communication portal. It, it, you have it's, it's a full time thing on its own. And Aaron, listen, if you don't have the capacity or the interest in doing it, then find someone who will do it for you. Hire a coach, hire Absolutely. a personal trainer. I mean, I hired a personal trainer fitness wise. I yeah. had a personal trainer for my son, and, and it's a huge reason why he made his middle school basketball team, which was a huge thing for him as a yeah. young seventh grader making a team with mostly eighth graders, right? Yeah. I, 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 I'll take credit as far as being involved in the designing of the workouts and sort of working hand in hand with the, with the personal trainer. But since I wasn't physically there during the week, which I would have done it if I would, hire a coach, hire a psychologist, hire a it's, therapist, it's, it's hire funny. a consultant. Is this it's is funny that, right. This is bring this that up because a, a it, counselor, whatever, right, right. This is your kid. Yeah. My daughter is at, University of Texas right now, as you know. What's she doing in Texas, by the way? Well, I don't think she loves Texas, but she she loves her school. She's got she's a honor roll, national honor student, ninety eight. Well, that's good. She's, but does she, she like the university? Because that campus is beautiful. She's not she, feeling it, huh? She doesn't mind the university. She's just not really feeling Texas. She's actually going over to Europe for university next year. She kind of vibes more with the Europe art music. You know, she you know what she's like. She's very she's very artistic. I don't know her as a 
18 year old. I know her as a seven year old. Really? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so. she's, she's, she's very much more artistic leaning. So she, she vibes more with the Europe yeah. um, vibe than the Texas vibe. But anyway, my point is mm-hmm. there were some things that she felt like she couldn't or didn't want to chat with us about. Mm-hmm. So she got a therapist. And she meets with a therapist every couple of weeks. Awesome. And I'm like, great, go find somebody that you can communicate with that gives you a different vantage point, maybe an unbiased vantage point. Get some stuff off your chest, right? Get some stuff off your chest. And and some parents would maybe be taken aback by that or be against that or whatever. Why would you not? You don't that? need that. There's nothing right. wrong with you. Why can't you talk to me? That's all really, really just just immature, unintelligent responses. It should Absolutely. be whatever it takes, whoever it takes to have the communication path happen. Right. Absolutely. And we, she talks to Liz and, you know, probably once every two days. So it's not like they don't talk, yep. but she wanted to have an outlet that was unbiased with a different vantage point. And maybe so, there's some private topics that she doesn't want to share with a parent. Fair enough. Great. Fair but, enough. But here's the thing. If you don't share them at all and they fester and they're bothering you and they're eating away at you, you don't want that. You don't want oh. that to be the case. Right. So maybe it does take, and I believe it takes more than we think a third party, right? Coach, consultant, counselor, therapist for most human beings. It may yes. be more so for kids because they're embarrassed to speak about things to their parents when they're 10 or 15, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's really great stuff. Well, now we've gone off. Should on. we should we stay on this topic or should I think, we? I think, I think we should stay on this topic. I and, mean, and, we're, and, and maybe pivot. So if you're watching this, the goal coming in was we were going to talk about customer development and retention. But, you know, this is this is our future generation. Um, we can pivot to customer development and retention on our very next episode. And if you're a parent yeah. watching this, I mean, this is, you know, I you, you know that I just started publishing a, a newsletter called the Renegade Report on Substack, which is about the public health crisis in America. I'm talking about America. It's a disaster. Yeah. We're in a chronic disease epidemic, but much of it is mental health as well. When you get physical health right, mental health tends to follow. A big reason why we're in a mental health crisis in America is because we're so poorly nourished, right? The nutrition is so bad. The processed food situation creates all kinds of cascading effects in the brain. And there's a hormone and endocrine system disruption with chemicals and with pollution and with bad water and bad food and, and these forever chemicals in our world. So they're disrupting the normal rhythm of the body, which is creating massive inflammation and immune type issues in America. America leads the world, especially our children. We lead the world in in chronic disease and obesity and diabetes and pre-diabetes. And I've written all about that and I will be writing all about that. And I'll, I'll link to the show notes here, the uh, the link to my, my Renegade Report publication. It's a personal project of mine. This isn't a money maker for me. This is the first time in my life at 50 years old I've ever taken on a project that is not about money, but it's about making a difference. And I think almost like the the title of the show, maybe we can adapt it, will be, you know, a deep dive into your financial and mental health. Sure. <laughs> Something along those sure, lines. Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. Because it, it, I know from my perspective, and we tend to always talk about things that are relevant to us right now, The because we had a little bit of a challenging quarter in the fourth quarter, what what happens is you have to take a step back and you have to analyze what's going on what changed, what's different. Now at the coming into the end of the first quarter, made adjustments, move forward, things are tracking back the, the, the way that they need to. But you have to take stock on what's going on. And that's why we started the show is I took stock on the finances. Mm-hmm. And the first thing I looked at was, what, what is my, I always say to my son, most problems are a process problem, mm-hmm. right? And we'll talk about that in a second. I had a process problem, I wasn't reviewing my internal household finances regularly with my wife. So we started doing that once a month. We've uncovered all of this crazy stuff and, and it's making huge impact. And I wasn't, I wasn't really auditing with a fine tooth comb the finances in the business because we were making so much money that you just start to go, ah, I don't care. You know, like it's this, it, it's- Yeah, it's, what's 300 here a month, 200 here a exactly. month, right? Yeah. And then you realize it's a death of a thousand cuts, right? And and what's the opportunity cost of having that, sure. that additional sure. profit that you could be putting into something else for leverage and so on and so forth. It's kind of the same when you're when you're talking to your kids or your spouse. You know, I looked at my son's grades last year and I really wasn't impressed with where his grades were at. And so I had to sit down and talk with him and say, why is it that you think 
that you're not achieving the goals that you've set for yourself and I've set. And, and we went back and forth and typical teenage conversation. Now, I'm not interested in that. I could care less about that. School is stupid. I want to focus on the things that I want to focus. I school, get it. Did he say school uh, is stupid? Yeah, he just said, my he daughter says like, that Dad, I can learn what everything. It's stupid. What is that? He's like, I can Google things. I can go to chat GPT. The uh, system is broken. And I said, look, I'm, 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 I'm ready to fall off my chair over here because that's a conditioned <laughs> thought that I just, it's that artificial intelligence thing. Again, I can just have someone think for me. I, I, it gets me so irate. Right. We well, have to I mean, fight that. That's a battle. And in fairness to him, he's like, dad, what, what purpose does it serve yep. for somebody to pound knowledge into me that isn't relevant to my current success and then ask me to regurgitate it and score me on how well I do that? What, what is the purpose? And I said, look, I can't Valid argue. question, right? Yeah. I said, I can't argue with your question or your point. What I can say is that being in school and being in university is actually just seeing how well you're able to adapt, communicate, become educated and endure the process. Because when you get into the real world, you will be asked to endure processes that you don't want to go through. Yeah. Yeah. And there is no unicorns and rainbows. This is Soleil like, asking you in, from a college standpoint or your son? It was actually school? my son, Ev. In from, high school. From a high school, from a high school perspective, perspective. Yep. because now she's studying the things that she wants to study. Yeah, so you have a little more flexibility you, to choose. Your you get more flexibility. He's talking about why am I studying these things and being scored on these things when they're completely irrelevant to real life and me. And I said, look, that's the question that's been asked by every kid going through high school. Yeah, for like how years. is geometry going to parlay into life, right? Right. Yeah. So I had to shift his understanding of this is just this is just a, a basically a test mm -hmm. to see how well you're you you can endure doing things you don't want to because when you get into the real world you will have to endure things and if you're not mentally strong enough to do that you will fail in the real world so this is really a challenge of your ability to to knuckle down and push through and do things that you don't want to do it will serve you very well you know in the future yeah. but then we took a future step or an additional step back and i said what do you, everything that 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 is average in its result, at least that I see in in fitness, in family, and in, in finances, in 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 business, it's a process issue. Hmm. So let's look at your process. You come home, you get home from school. Sometimes you're going to the gym. Sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're studying. Sometimes you're not. You're up in your room. We don't see you for a couple hours. You're fluffing around. You're gaming with your friends. You're doing whatever. Rule number one is if you want to be successful, you have to calendar everything. If you don't calendar your life, other things will come to steal your time. Routine. Routine. So we have to put a routine in that, that are in alignment with your goals and we support you in doing. So we all of a sudden rescheduled everything and we said, here's school. This block is gym, fitness, volleyball. It's, it's physical. You come home. You have dinner, you decompress for a half an hour, you come back, you do homework. So we so we put that in, we all agreed on it, still wasn't working, still wasn't happening. Was it he wasn't he wasn't hitting the, the habit? He wasn't hitting the homework specific habit. So then we had to take another run at it and say, okay, it's a process issue. And I said to him, I think the process issue is you you intend to do homework when you go in your room, but that's when your computer is or your phone yeah. is, it's yeah. distractions, it's this, it's that. So we have to change the process. So now he comes down and he does homework in my office without his phone and he's got nothing to distract him. And now you're starting to see the grades improve. And I didn't come down on him and say, what is wrong with you? You're stupid. Why aren't you doing this? Like you, why be better? You know, I wasn't doing that. I was analyzing the process because 99% of the times it's not a lack of desire. It's a process problem. I, two things I want to mention. Phenomenal answer. I, I, want to, I want to piggyback off your answer as to, like, why do I need to do the schoolwork? But to your last point there, I think it's brilliant, and this works in business too, is you changed his environment. That to me is a big thing, right? When you get out of your normal environment that maybe has you stuck, the mind does, does wonders when it gets into a new environment. Correct. So as an example, from a business standpoint, and, and today's Friday when we're recording the show, um, I have a home office, but I have, a, I have virtual office space in Naples where I live as well, because once in a while I want to change the environment. And I use that as a, and I did it yesterday. I reserve a conference room for myself for six hours 
and I go get a lot of my writing and creative work done that would not get done in my normal environment where I have Zoom sessions and fires that I need to put out and running a company and people needing me and you're the same way, right? Yeah. But it's, that, it's but really that little hack right there, you did it with your son. I did it yesterday. That little hack right there, moving out of the normal environment that might have you pulled in a couple different directions to go zero in and focus is working for him because now he's getting the homework done because he's in an environment now that's conducive to productivity. Now, what happens is that's an anchor. So now what happens is that environment, his mind starts to be wired for production in that environment. So that environment, if you keep going with this, will always be looked at as the place he gets his work done and always gets it done. Right. If it you, puts if you, you in, if you in pull, a state. Yeah, it's, it's an anchor, right? If you pull that, if you pull it away and you'd be like, okay, so it worked twice. Now go back to doing it in your room. He'll probably revert back to the bad habits. But the anchor of your office where he started the habit and he started the routine will normally stick because the environment is so productive and conducive to what you're talking about. Works wonders for me too. I get, I usually have three or four writing like creation and writing projects that I will bring to the conference room table in the conference room for a day. And I, I jokingly say to my team, I don't communicate with humans on this day. So don't even bother. Like I don't do humans. I don't do calls. I don't do Zooms. I don't do human beings. The only human beings I do is if I'm going to go get something to eat or I'm going to go out to the main area of the office and somebody says hello or, or do you want a coffee or whatever. That's the, there's not going to be Zooms. There isn't going to be fires. You can all figure it out, and at 5 o'clock when the day's over, I'll check in, and my guess is that the world didn't end from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. when I was working on growing the company, building initiatives, building new products, building new pipelines, right, doing new creation. That works wonders. I've been teaching that to my private client group for probably 15 years now, is that, and you've probably heard me say it on stage in years past is if you can yep. change your environment, you might have a couple different environments. You might have an environment for writing. You might have an environment for doing content like we're doing right now, clearly. And then you might have another environment where it's okay, throw it at me. I'm going to deal with Slack. I'm going to deal with Skype. I'm going to deal with Zooms. I'm going to run my company. And it's going to be, you know, shock and awe coming at me, but really difficult to do all of that from the same environment. Very difficult. It's funny that I think when we do these shows, a lot of the times, we're talking to listeners, we're talking to viewers, but the majority of the time I find we're just talking to each other. Good. So when you look at earlier in the show, I was talking about these new financial processes that we've put into place and the audits that we did and all the money that we found and done. And you said, oh my God, I gotta, I gotta do this. I've been thinking about doing it. I, I'm gonna go do it now. I'm listening to you and I've got my calendar right now is blocked out because as you know, I'm creating an academy from Seven Mile where people can come and learn. Mm -hmm. I need to get the content done for that. So go. I followed my own processes and I blocked two hours a morning out to create content. It says it right at the top of my calendar. I've created in the last week, zero content. <laughs> zero. Even though I have 10 hours blocked for it content. It takes a big Why? man to admit that you've got nothing done. I mean, we're all human, right? Yeah. It, the problem is I come and I sit in this office. That's the issue. And I turn the, my computer on and it goes bing, 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 bing. You fell into the black hole of, of distraction and running the company. What you should do, Aaron, is take your laptop. You got a big house. Either find a different spot in the house or get out of the house and go to an area where you can pop on your, no, your cancellation headphones and you can drill down. Let, listen, you, if people did this, they could write a book. This is what big authors do, by the way. I, I, I read a couple of mystery authors. Um, and, and there's a guy by the name of Harlan Coben, who's, who's one of the most, <laughs> if you ever want to like go down the path of some people will do Netflix series and watch eight hours of that. I mean, do a book for three, four hours, chapter book, Harlan Coben. I have probably 10 of his books, uh, brilliant mystery writer, story writer. It's like six things going on at once and they all come together at the end. One of those, right? Where mm -hmm. the, the chapters leave you hanging sort of like Netflix. Right. But what I learned it, my mind goes to how does he do what he does? Right. Go research this guy. Figure out process, to your point. Okay, so the show's on process. Fine. We just changed the name. It's a process show. Process <laughs> with parenting. Process with finance. Process with business. Process with content creation. It's a process yep. show. There you have it. Anyways, they Harlan Coben, right? So I dig down on the Harlan Coben business model, right? What, what does he do? I mean, he gets a $14 million signing bonus from some big publisher every time he's ready to do a new book, and he does one a year. So he gets the, the signing bonus. I don't know if it's that high every time, and then, and then it's all promotion at that point. 
Yep. But the writing of the book and the storyboarding and the content, these guys have to disappear, Aaron. Like, they might go, some of them I've read, John Grisham is another big one. Sometimes yep. they'll go basically on a vacation by themselves for a week. They'll go to a hotel and, and, and maybe an area where there's a lot of nature and it's sort of out of the urban parts of the country. And they'll go and basically just write for a week. So they environment, process, process, environment. So they change the environment, number one, and they completely disrupt the process for creation. And I noticed that that's what a lot of the big authors did. So I'm like, why don't I take a piece of that playbook and just do that for a couple hours here and there? So if I have to get writing done, I got to do a script that was developing, I was writing one of my newsletters one day, I was yesterday I was writing a business script for a new product we're, we're launching, all things that would not get done if I was sitting right here where all the fires get put out and the company gets run and I shoot the podcast and we do the normal day-to-day -day things. So I just took a playbook from Harlan Coben, my favorite mystery writer, and said, well, I'm not going to disappear for a week, but I might disappear for a half a day. Maybe then ultimately a day. Maybe the habit starts to grow from a, a morning to an afternoon and then maybe into a full day. And now I'm in the habit of, in 2024 of, for the most part, Thursdays are no human beings day. I don't want to talk to people. I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to deal with anybody except my family. On Thursdays, that's been my routine. So the calendar is blocked. There are no calls. There are no fires. There's generally no emergencies that can't wait a day or half a day. And that's now starting to become a habit and a process, and an environment change that makes the habit and the process work. I think it's phenomenal because now I'm all of a sudden thinking about my calendar. I'm thinking you're thinking about, about where you're going, right? Where I'm you thinking going? about where I'm going. I'm, th I'm already thinking about, well, if I take that computer, what, no, I, I'm going to have to delete those apps off it because it's going to ping away. And I'm already, I'm already future forecasting mm -hmm. what I'm going to be doing because I'm thinking, I got, that's all I have to do. I have to change the environment and shut out the world. And, and the question I have for you is, how much leverage and impact do those activities have versus your day-to-day -day firefighting? The two things I'll say. There's way more impact, to your point, because you're normally choosing things that are revenue-producing, that are drivers of the business, right? Drivers of the project, number one. The second part is how good you feel. This is like an endorphin rush. You feel so productive and you feel like you've accomplished so much because you're not getting pulled in a multiple different directions and it isn't a fragmented use of your energy. It's a very clean use of your energy in one core area, writing, maybe it's video work, whatever, the, whatever it is, fill in the blank. You feel great at the end of the day because the pulling of your attention into multiple areas starts to get frustrated. It starts to get agitating. Right? If, you're, if you're really, really busy and you're running big companies with huge teams, you'll understand what I'm saying. If you're a one-man show and it's just you and an assistant, you don't feel this as much. But if you're running a Port, big team... Cortisol is always pounding through your system. Yeah, you're like putting out fires. You're going from this to that to this to that to this. And, and you're, you're really allowing yourself to get into that environment of being sort of a punching bag. And it's, it's normal if you're running a company. But I think a lot of business owners and, and owners or CEOs... They, they get into this unconscious routine of thinking that that's the normal day-to-day. -day. And it normally is the normal day-to-day, -day, but you've got to somehow recognize this and have great awareness and go, well, if I'm going to want to create something and promote or do a show or write a book or do something that will next level my company, I'm going to have to disconnect from the mayhem periodically and be okay with that and let the team know that that you need to be okay with that. And, you know, you're not, you're not a fireman, right? There isn't a fire all day long. You don't need to be there with the hose, right? And you need to just walk away and say, I'm going to work on me. I'm going to work on my stuff, which ultimately is the company stuff. My, comp my, my company is probably, tw my team is about 12 to 14-ish, and they love it. They go, wow, that's great that you do that. You're going to build this for the company? I mean, so my messaging to them is, anything I'm doing, it's going to be to grow the company and create new initiatives that really create job security for all of you because we'll make more money. And they love yeah. that. How would they not love that, right? It's, it's not just about putting out fires. It's about creating new revenue streams. We're, we're, we, launched, we launched a whole new product um, in February because of this. Like we're launching and we're about to launch it cold to the public, but we launch everything internally within our membership base and our customer base at first, which is, you know, lead generation AI system. It's phenomenal, right? But that's not going to get developed by me you know, trying to piece it in with 30 minutes here, 20 minutes here, your two hours in the morning, great intention, great idea. The only piece missing is the environment needs to change just like you did with your son. Yeah. You and, changed and his environment and it worked. 
and that's what I have to do for myself. So it's great to do this show sometimes because you, you step away from it going, what's my one big takeaway for today? My big takeaway is I got to change my environment for those two hours that I calendared out. And the funny thing is, is that when you get in that routine, that firefighting routine, mm. sometimes it actually biologically keeps you stuck there because there's something about answering that email, answering that Slack, boom, boom, boom. You get this endorphin rush of, oh, I was productive. I was productive. I was productive. I knocked this out. I knocked this out. I knocked this out. I got Nick. But the problem is that there's immediate and there's important. And anytime somebody wants something from you, it's, it's immediate. But is it really actually important? Mm -hmm. Gary Vaynerchuk calls it clouds and dirt, right? The day-to-day -day stuff is the dirt. It's all immediate. But is it really important? It's important to them in their mind. But is it actually important to the growth of the business? Because if, if you just stay in that immediate day in, day out, day out, there's actually no progress. There's actually no evolution of the business. Yeah, you look at the end of the week and you're like, what did I do? What did I do? What big initiative was moved? What big rock was moved? Nothing. What did I do? It was just a lot of ba 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 ba. Whereas if you can carve out a Thursday, mm -hmm. for example, and say, "What's my one big rock I'm going to put into place?" and you do that 52 times in a year, you look at your competitor and they, you say, "Well, they're exactly the same as they were last year. We have 52 different things we did to improve." And then boom, you go right past them. And like you said, the emotional side of it. I'm sure you feel this way sometimes too. I'll get in on a Monday and by Thursday I'm exhausted. I'm like, it's Groundhog Day. It's just boom, fire, 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 fire. I get excited and I get reinvigorated by creating. Everybody does. Everybody's wired to achieve and create. And th that's not creating. No. That's just, that's just knocking down immediate to-dos. Mm -hmm. But you can get a habit of feeling like that's work, like that's, that's productivity. It's not really productivity. Right. Productivity is creating, evolving, thinking. You know, I, I, I look at some of the things that I have planned for this year and I'm going, okay, if I get this big project done, I've got these 10 joint ventures that I can go and establish that I have these great relationships and I can set up anchors in each one of them. And then boom, they can flood the business to double to triple the size. That's why I'm doing the content creation. And yet I'm sitting there doing $20 an hour activities <laughs> all day, boom, 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 instead of million dollar activities over there. And I know better. It's not like I'm not aware. Most of it's unconscious because it's Most habit. Of it's unconscious. The habits go both ways. They go and they go the right way and the wrong way. They're habits. It's it's human nature. So this comes all the way back to my son. What's the problem? It's a process problem. Process problem, right? It's a it's process, process problem. right? So we've talked today about process when it comes to parenting, process mm -hmm. when it comes to finance, mm -hmm. process when it comes to productivity in your business, which is really what this, this end point was. Here's a couple things I'll say on that Thursday thing. I would not recommend doing a full day out of the gates. It's too much. It's, it's almost like the person who hasn't worked out in 10 years and now they want to work out six days a week. The body, <laughs> the mind can't handle it. It's like you went from nothing to like an Olympic routine. Right. If I was training somebody in fitness, I would say, we're going to work out three days a week for 30 minutes and we're going to get a result from that. And then that's going to become contagious and it's going to become a habit. It's the same thing with this. Mm -hmm. um, the recommendation I've always made in this Thursday thing, and I do this with my private clients and my, my mastermind group that I run here in, in Florida for 14 un consecutive years now, Aaron, as you know, is I tell them your Thursday with me is your disconnect from society day, your disconnect from your company day, and you'll see your family tonight. Can you pull it off? Can you not check social media? Can you not check email? Can you not check Slack? Can you not check in with your company? Because you're coming here to spend a day to work on the business. You're working on yourself. You're working on your projects. And you're working on making yourself and the business stronger. So you're working on the business, not in the business, for that one day in a month. That's a lot for some people, right? They're paying to do that. So normally when you pay for that, you'll, you'll stick to it. But I say, guys, yeah. we're, we only meet once a month. There's three other Thursdays in a month. Can you replicate this on your own? And the challenge is, can you go find, like I do, I practice what I preach. On that Thursday, can you go rent an office space, 
go to an office, go to another office within your office, go to a conference room, lock down for four hours. What do you know you need to do right now? Is it a sales funnel? Is it a video? Is it a script? Is it some sort of a promotion? You know what you need to do. Is it a joint venture is opportunity? Joint venture? Is it analyzing but, competitors? Like, is it a There's business so plan? Is it writing something? Is it your Is news? it auditing your financials is to see a, where you're wasting a bunch of money? Ever it is, exactly. Th that falls into that four hour or ultimately eight hour bucket on, again, my example, on a Thursday. So it's nice to know that you go, you know what? It's compartmentalized now. I'm going to go put it over here on the Thursday. I know I need to do it. And I'm, well, I'm going to stick it in on a Tuesday. And they're like, oh, well, let's try it on a Wednesday night. And you're all like amped up and you don't feel good about it. But if you know, hey, I'm going to get to that on my Thursday day. They call this in some coaching circles. They call it like your creative day, right? So on my creative day or my creative morning or my creative afternoon, for some people, maybe you want to work Thursday morning from 8 to 12 and handle what you handle and you're done from 12 to 6. Maybe that's your spot, right? But the key is to find a, a, a short window, in, at least initially, two, three hours, four hours, a half a day. Ultimately, it could become a full day, right? To my example with Harlan Coben, the writer, it's a week, two weeks. Those guys will shut down for a week or two to write a, a, a blockbuster million-dollar book. All of these habits, success leaves clues. All mm -hmm. of these habits can be adopted and tweaked, right, and adapted to your lifestyle. But this one day per week or one morning per week or one afternoon per week example that I'm giving you is something I've tried to do for a long time. There's some weeks I get away from it. It isn't locked in 52 weeks. There are some weeks. And look at the similarities, right? Now I do one finance meeting with my wife for two hours a month, one with my CFO, I have one dinner a week with my son, right? They're all the same thing. Locked in. It's all locked in and it's all just putting that calendaring and creating that process. And then you see the compounding results of just thinking it through and being proactive versus being reactive. Yeah, and the habit piece is important too because then it starts to become automatic. And when things become automatic, right, that's that's a that's a big deal because then, then there's no thought. Automatic is key because now it's habit, automatic baked in everybody's human you might get off it for a day you might be vacationing one week you might have an event to go to you might be traveling it you could pivot the days but for the most part if you find your window and keep it really simple at first to that small window of two three four hours before you commit to a whole day or even a whole week the funny thing about this is you're like i kind of want to do that again tomorrow yeah right <laughs> that's it like it's like this is more way more fun and interesting than the stuff that you don't necessarily love to do as an owner or a CEO, it becomes something you start to look forward to, you know, as an adaption, as a, as a, as a, um, an extension of that, Aaron, I'll, I'll actually, I'll go to like my favorite breakfast spot before that day begins by myself, before I get to that office space and I'll have like a nice breakfast. I'm in Florida. So I'm, I'm sitting outside at eight in the morning. I'm having coffee and, you know, omelet, whatever, drink hanging out, maybe organizing the day ahead. And then I'm shooting over the office and then I've got my locked in space. And it's like, man, this is like a very unstressed day. Doesn't very it just feel, feel free. free and light and happy yes. and creative. We as humans have got to seek to find that feeling because that feeling eliminates stress and it creates way more creativity. If we're in fight or flight mode all the time, like a lot of people are in business who have big teams and have families and a million things going on, that eventually is, is going to be crippling to your own personal health, right? Which is something that I speak about and write about and, and produce content about quite a bit is that's a, pub, that's a health problem at yep. some point if, you don't, if you're not able to, I guess, bring that stress level down. And increase that productivity. So it becomes fun. It becomes something you get addicted to. It becomes something you look forward to and you enjoy. Um, yeah. So I got to take away from you. You got to take away from me. Indeed. In fact, I'm going to box in. I, I, I need to do the financial audit. You need to do the environment thing. You're already doing yeah. it with your son. It isn't a big leap. And then from there, I mean, if you're listening right now, just go start. It's like the workout, right? Just start. But the most important thing about starting is, is start really small and get the quick win and get the good feeling for the quick win. And then you can start to expand on time and capacity. Most people will go too big too soon and it, it won't work. Right? Again, it's my, yeah, it's my workout other, analogy. It, it won't work. And I think the other thing I'll add to that and then we'll wrap it up yeah. is every time I hear or I watch or I read something. Yep. 
that I know is truth. I always get this like feeling in my gut, like what I'm hearing or reading or seeing right now is truth. If you listened to this show today and there was an element in here where it resonated with you at a core level where you went, that's me, this is truth. It, it almost excites you internally. It's hard to describe the energy. It does. The best thing that you can do is go lock that thing in right now because that energy will dissipate as time goes by and the rest of the things come back into your world. When you have clarity on something, you have to go and act on it right now before everything comes back in and tries to reprioritize itself in your life. Great point. Great ending point there because, yeah, implementation is key. But you're right. When you when you feel like you've cracked the code and figured something out, it's a good feeling. Right. You've you've if you like I can already see you're like, oh, dad, that's what I needed for today. Yep. I, I feel like I've, I've cracked the code on why there's a sticking point with me creating this content that I know I need to create. If you can now discipline yourself enough to now see the idea through and go find the new environment and go lock in for two or three hours once a week. And then maybe ultimately it's two days a week. And then who knows, maybe it becomes three days a week. You will be blown away at the amount of production you're capable of as a human yep. being. It's incredible. The distractions today are on another level. Next week, when we talk about the, the topic we were supposed to talk about today, which is customer retention and customer development, a big problem with that is there's too many choices and they can't stay focused because there's too many choices and there's overwhelm. And that's a process thing for us as well as business owners is can we create an environment for our customers where they don't want to leave because it's interesting, it's fun, it's entertaining, it might be somewhat exciting, and they're always doing new things for me as a customer. They're rolling out new things, new trainings, new ideas, new events. How can you create a better process and a better environment for your customers so that you can win the retention game. Because I'll tell you folks, this retention thing is a battle today. This is why we started the show talking about it and why we'll absolutely commit, commit the whole episode next week to retention is because the retention thing is brutal today. We fight like hell to retain against a lot of choices and a lot of competition and a lot of distraction today. Awesome. Great show today. I'll buddy. leave it there, buddy. This was great as always. Uh, that's Andrew. That's Aaron. Hey, wait, are you Andrew or are you Aaron? That's Aaron. This is Andrew. Uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Awesome. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Sales Velocity TV is powered by Pipeline Pro, the ultimate all-in-one sales pipeline management and marketing automation platform that makes all others obsolete. And we can prove it. Take a tour at gopipelinepro.com. See you on the next episode.